This week on Snark Squad Pod, we're joined by Max from Well Done Books to talk about the novel My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. Welcome back to Snark Squad Pod. I am your host, Marines, and with me as always is my co-host. Hello, Nicole Sweeney, and we are joined this week by Max. Hi, I'm Max. You can find me on Instagram at Well Done Books. And Max is here to discuss a novel that you two actually buddy read together the first yeah. time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, like, I think that's true. I don't know. Uh, this is my first time reading this book, and I am the one who gets to do the plot synopsis. So that's very. It's great. It's great. It's going to go great for everyone, I'm sure. Before I get into plot synopsis, I'm just going to say that there's like a very real chance that I'm going to butcher some of these name pronunciations. I'm very sorry. I think I'm saying them the way the audiobook lady said them to me, but also, I don't know. I'm, I'm, d- I'm going to do my best. So the novel begins with a sort of prologue to the story in the present day with our narrator, Elena, finding out that her friend, Leela, has gone missing of, of her own accord. She's not hasn't been taken. She, she has disappeared, chosen to disappear. And as like, I don't know, petty revenge, she's going to undisappear her friend by writing a whole ass novel about their lives together. Uh, was my, my feeling from that prologue. So then from there, we go all the way back to the two of them meeting as children. And this book basically it follows their lives from when they first meet as when they're like, I don't know, five or six, maybe up until they're about 16 when Leela gets married. They meet in school uh, where Leela is very disruptive, but also very, very smart. And Elena also does well in school, but mostly because she takes a quick liking to Leela and just kind of wants to remain in her orbit. Uh, eventually, they finish elementary school. They live in a fairly poor neighborhood. Leela's family will not pay for her to continue to go to school past elementary school, whereas Elena's family will. And so you kind of watch, like, even though they're, they're both from fairly poor backgrounds, that sort of introduces like a higher level of, of class divide, I guess, between the two of them as Elena goes off to school and Leela doesn't. But like, even not in school, Leela spends a lot of time checking out books. And so there's, there's still this com- like intellectual competitiveness between them. And uh, there's like so many, so many side characters in this neighborhood that all have different <laughs> plots. But like, ultimately, it is the story of, of these two, these two girls. Like, there's, you know, family members and all sorts of enmities within this neighborhood. But that is like, I think that this plot synopsis will run away from me if I try to like (laughs) pin down all of those individual details. But mostly it's the story of the like very sort of complicated and contentious but close friendship between these two young women. Yes. Yes. Okay. (laughs) There is a lot of minutia um, to the to the story as a whole, and so we. I read this book originally. Max and I buddy read it. Max suggested it to me as a buddy read. Funnily enough, I think that Max and I were talking about like side projects we would want to be involved in, and a podcast came up, and then we quickly were like, we don't have time for that. Let's just read a book together. (laughs) That's how. Could have just um, that's how, published I know. boxer messages as a as a podcast, honestly. <laughs> pretty and much. We yeah. ended up talking pretty intensely over months while we read the series together. Yeah. <laughs> and so we both have completed All that the lost series. Content, you guys. I know. <laughs> For real. A boxer ate it. <laughs> um, so we both finished the series and we we both loved it. That's kind of a spoiler for this next <laughs> session sec- section, but this book got back on our radar because HBO is adapting it as a series and it's going to premiere in November of this year of 2018. So I immediately was like Nicole we're going to watch this. Also, you're going to read the books. So, <laughs> um, that's that's what we do here. Um, and then the whole back and forth of like trying to decide how we would tackle this, because I, I feel like this series is a series, but it is very definitely one story in four parts. So I wasn't sure if we wanted to read all the books and then do the whatever. But so the long and short of it is that I decided we just dedicate a whole episode to the first book in the series because I just felt like there was enough here to talk about. So all that said, that's why I forced my best friend to read this. Um, and now I get to ask her, did you like it? I hate that I have to answer this question first. I... I guess so, is my answer. I I didn't 
dislike it. I didn't actively dislike it. I definitely didn't love it. I have sort of weird feelings about it. Obviously, I just finished reading it a few hours before we started recording this podcast because, you know, that's (laughs) what I do. That's always the story. And I, it seems like something that might grow on my feelings a little bit if I have more time to sit with it. But also, and, and I think I think it will grow on my feelings after I listen to you guys gush about it. Like, I think it'll be a little bit like the the way that Sam affects us when we're talking about the A Song of Ice and Fire books. I know I personally have gone into those podcast episodes increasingly negative about the books, but then Sam gets so excited that I'm like, okay, maybe I did really enjoy this and I do <laughs> want to keep going. Uh, so so I'm, I'm anticipating something kind of like that happening here. I appreciate fundamentally the fact that this is a story of a female friendship, just that and a complicated one. I, 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 I enjoy that. I found it really hard to care about these characters. Not I don't know. I just kind of didn't care for a, a large chunk of the book. And it wasn't until over halfway that my reading was propel like was actually being motivated by a desire to know what happened next rather than just well I have to get through this so that I don't know the writing was not my favorite also and I don't know how much of that is owed to it being a work in translation I don't really read that many works in translation and I don't know enough about that process to to be able to distinguish what's going on there with that so I don't know so those those are sort of my two big issues was the writing was not my favorite I kind of didn't care that much about these characters but I I appreciate the idea of this story, I think. And there were definitely some moments uh, and just some some themes and some concepts that I enjoyed here. And I am curious what happens next. Max, I already kind of spoiled that you love this series, but <laughs> <laughs> please tell the people not only it, like your what you words. think about yeah, in your own words, <laughs> not only what you think about it now on reread, but kind of uh, your experience reading it for the first time and if that's changed at all. Yeah, absolutely. First, I want to say that, Nicole, your thoughts on this are not uncommon, especially regarding the first of the four books. I think that it is quite a commitment, and I would echo what Mari said, too, about how it's root- at its core, this series is really one ginormous story that just couldn't feasibly be published in one one book. So hmm. the author herself, whoever she is, um, because she is a student, like a what's the word, an anonymous author. No one actually knows who the author is. Um, She has said before that this book series is really one book. She just had to logistically break it up into four, or at the time, I think originally it was supposed to be a trilogy, um, into four books. So I would say that it does take a lot of commitment to get into, but it's so rewarding. And so that kind of goes into my feelings about this. I think we both had this feeling originally um, when Mari and I read the first book and that was all we had consumed of this series. And that was my first Ferrante novel as well, is I liked it a lot. And I think I saw it sort of like I saw books in school, where I was like, I, I know there's something special about this and I can appreciate its value, especially as a modern work of literature. I think that I could almost tell that this book is something that I people will still be reading in a long time. But it wasn't until I'd gone through the series that I really loved it because there is a lot happening in this first book and you you barely skim the surface of the main character's psyche and, and connect with her in a way that, or you connect with her a lot more as the series goes on. And I think looking back at this book upon rereading it, I just appreciate and like, I'm attached to these characters so much more than someone might be on their first reading of it. This book is full of so many things that I probably have said like negative things about elsewhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, it's like basically one of those books that you, you know, people are like, no, no, you've got to like really front load your investment and then it gets better. And so you're asking people to do a lot of yeah. buy in. No. Uh, <laughs> but listen, <laughs> you really have to front load your investment here and I think uh, yes on first read I my first messages to Max were basically all like uh like I don't I don't care basically and also like I wasn't sure 
there's a feeling with uh, Ferrante's writing. Uh, there's like this heightened expectation almost. And she like reading it. I always was expecting almost like something to jump out at me from behind the corner. Like this feeling of some expectation of this shoe was going to drop, um, which is funny thinking about the story. Um, but, it, it, you know, it, it that never came for so long that it started to get a little wary. But I think um, after the 50 percent mark, pretty much half of the book that second half really really started to pull things together for me and you really start to realize that the first half of this book and this first book in the series overall is laying a lot of groundwork and it's it's I don't know. I just appreciate it so much more on reread. Sorry, Nicole. And also in retrospect. <laughs> My favorite phrase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and in retrospect of having the context of the full series and even even in and of itself, without giving spoilers away for the rest of the series, I think there are themes that you are better able to pick up as you continue to read. But we know to look for them because we've read further in the series, but I think there are things contained here that are worthwhile. Um, it, it, so I don't know. I, we are going to hear us gush, gush about this, and I do hope that it, it kind of helps elevate this in your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I was very worried that you were going to outright hate this because it is a strange book. I would be curious, too. I've never listened to any of Bronte's work on audio, and her work is very visceral, and her writing, and I think Anne Goldstein, who translates it, does a really amazing job. So I don't know if the Nicole, if your dislike of or not dislike, but not total enjoyment of the writing was because of the format. I'd be very curious now to go and listen to one of her books because they are so psychological, and you're so in Elena's head that I don't know. It'd almost be too close for comfort, maybe because it is. And especially as the series goes on, it gets so dark. I mean, I guess it's already dark in the first book, but I, w- I would be curious to, s- to s- experience that or her work in a new way by listening to it. And I'm curious if, I mean, you haven't read them, so it, you can't really compare the experiences. Well, I, but... did, I, I did both at the oh, same time. I had so I had the ebook from the library, and then I used an audible credit for the for the audiobook, and so I I did them I did it at the same time, just because I, a, a thing I just dis- this I discovered as the the hack I think Mari was the one who suggested it for the A Song of Ice and Fire books, just because there's so much detail, and I find yeah I find that with stuff that that's like very information dense, it is easier for me to track it that way because I'm just like I don't know I'm reading it, and then also it's in my ears, and it's like. I'm like in it, deeply in it. So (laughs) I originally read parts and then listened to parts. I think especially in the beginning when I was kind of stalling, I was listening to parts on audiobook and then the second half of the book I read. And then for reread, I entirely did the whole listen and read at the same time. I have no problems with Ferrante's writing. I think that uh, she does. It's almost abrasive, her writing style. There's something that is very like in your face about her writing style. It's not very flowery, um, but I found, I don't know, I thought that it was, it very perfectly captured somebody's tone of voice um, and telling us the story was kind of conversational, but it had that like sharp abrasive style to it as well. So, but I listened to it and I also love her writing. So I don't know if it was just like the method that was delivered or if it was just kind of like um, a mist for Nicole, the writing style overall. There were. It's interesting that you describe it as abrasive because that was is definitely not what I was reacting to about it. Like there were just there were places where it 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 felt. I agree that it wasn't flowery, but where it was almost just like overwrought. Like it was. I don't know to the point of of kind of nonsense. Like I I don't have very, any good examples of this. I I should have <laughs> I should have <laughs> highlighted some some things, but I there was just this general sense of like now you're just being excessive. <laughs> yeah. I guess yeah. that I, I had frequently with the writing. Yeah, I think that I noticed that even more on this reread, especially reading it through the lens and remembering that this is actually what we're reading is something that Elena is writing down. And so to remember that any moment where she sort of does these tangents where she doesn't describe what's going on around here, but she'll start to describe her emotions and like mm-hmm. feelings in such a long winded way. And like the, the, I think that abrasive, I would agree in the sense that I think abrasive, they're sort of 
harsh and really unfiltered. And I think that she's very raw and honest, even when she looks kind of petty and like selfish. But I think that reading it and remembering, okay, she's actually writing this book and not to spoil things for the later on in the series um, or the books later on in the series. But obviously I think we can all tell like writing is a part of her life and, and books right. are very important to her. So it's, it made me kind of question like how much of this, and I always had this feeling reading this series the first time, but how much of this is reliable and not in the sense that the actions and the things that happened did or didn't happen, but how she's perceiving and remembering them and recording them to get quote unquote, get back at her friend for disappearing, you know, how reliable is that? And, and also she's a teenager for most of this installment in the series. So of course your emotions are going to be heightened and, and kind of abrasive and everything seems like the end of the world. But for some of the things in that happened to them, it is very damaging. It's not just like petty teen drama, like their lives are at stake and there's a lot of violence and it's gritty, gritty, I guess is the sense that I get. Even without knowing where it's going, it was still clear reading this book that like this is a single person's account of these events, uh, that this is a single person's version of all of this. I think just, you know, by virtue of the fact that we see Leela largely through the lens of Elena's obsession with her that like that there that inherently means that you're getting kind of a distorted sense of 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 what's going on and and not in a way that that I don't I don't mean that as like as a criticism or anything like I think I think that that is communicated well that that's I don't know what that's going to mean for the rest of the story but here like you know we begin with I'm gonna get you back by writing this <laughs> writing this this whole story and then you know throughout this book there's you know the, the talk of them writing a novel together and whatever so yes I think that's part of what it charmed me at the end of the day about this book was just the way that it was framed. I love framed narratives and I love stories within stories. So the fact that it started with her sitting down like, ahem, and now I shall tell you <laughs> like the entire story that my friend would love uh, for for it to disappear or whatnot. And I think that some of that, like the wandering aspects of the beginning of the story that I struggled with when I originally read it, like put into that frame, she's trying to pin down the moment that they became friends. And mm -hmm. it's almost very rambly. She's like, okay, let me tell you about Don Aquile and let me tell you about the dolls. But then all of a sudden she's like, wait, wait, go back, go back. Okay, we're in <laughs> elementary school. And she's like, okay, back to uh -huh, Don Aquile. Uh -huh, okay, uh -huh. no, wait, but there was this one time and I'm just like, girl, like settle down. But also <laughs> if you were to like, you know, ask anybody, hey, tell me the, the entire like, you know, genesis of your friendship with so-and-so, right. it'd kind of be like, okay, okay, hold on. There's this one time. And that's kind of how the storytelling felt to me, especially on reread. So I think that that kind of like wandering, rambly tone and just even some of that stuff that seems overwrought, um, I thought was very deeply seated in Elena's voice and the fact that she was telling the story and just kind of that fluid, like, let me tell you a story kind of manner. And it was interesting to me the things that she to chose to emphasize, like all of her feelings and, you know, how how difficult puberty was for her and all of these things. And then there are some things like, oh, yeah, like my dad hit my mom that she would just gloss over. And I'm mm -hmm. like, whoa, that's a big deal. Yeah. You know, so like just the, <laughs> the things. Yeah. <laughs> the things even in her own point of view that she emphasized versus what, you know, was kind of so, you know, normal to her, or whatever that she just kind of skipped over. I think the idea of this whole series framed by that narrative, and it's a very distinct narrative where she's telling a story ties into what Elena, the character in her own story, is trying to figure out and constantly referring back to in these moments that are pivotal. So like for her, these moments are the dolls and the boys, you know, throwing rocks at them and then their school competitions and all these little things that on the outside seem very trivial or just the little minutia of everyday life, but they constantly are aware and yet not aware, especially at a young age, of the history of their neighborhood and of Naples and of Italy at large post-World War II, because this book is taking place in, I think both girls are born in the early 40s, and so they were born right at the middle to the end of World War II, and also there's all this violence and gang activity and neighborhood drama that happened before they were born or aware of it that they're grappling with because they see the effects of that day to day with how people treat each other in the neighborhood, the sort of unspoken rivalries. And I think that even drips down a little bit into Elena and Leela's not rivalry, but unspoken competition that they have 
where they're always trying to one-up each other. But I think it's almost more one-sided to Elena trying to beat out Leela because Leela like, doesn't really care. She's like, I don't care. I'm I'm just trying to be the best at what I can do. And that drives Elena to, to be better. I think that in, in the minutia of this story, it does start to develop a lot of themes and a lot of like symbolism and stuff. And I think one of my favorite things that this does um, is, is talk about that before. And I think it's such a childhood thing. Like I can remember, for instance, like driving to my aunt's house and she lived in like a neighboring city and like we would go pretty much once a week. And it wasn't until I started driving at like 16 that I could put into perspective where exactly she lived and like, oh, like starting to see like landmarks and how that all changed when I started to grow up. And so things like that, that are very difficult for a child to place into context, like space and a map and the way that they never left their neighborhood for a long time. And the people who kind of populate the story, who all had these lives before they were born and kind of trying to put that into perspective. And there's even a moment where, um, you know, they, they've been so focused on like school and like romance and stuff. But then Lena starts asking questions like she's like, OK, but what's fascism? <laughs> it is just such a moment of like, yes, OK, history exists and how that starts to come into perspective for a child I love 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 that theme of like I see this with my nieces where we'll show them pictures and they're like where am I and you know that's before you were born and they're like what (laughs) like that whole concept of like (laughs) what do you mean I wasn't born like it's so foreign to a child to think about that time and I love that the the way that this captured it and how she starts slowly weaving that context into the story as they get older I think the symbolism you mentioned is a great point, too. There were so many images or items or things that I noticed upon rereading that pop up throughout. And the first really obvious one being Don Achille, almost as his own mythological like symbol. I think she even calls him at some point an ogre, or they mm-hmm. refer to him as that. And it, I, th- I remember us talking about this when we read it together for the first time, about how there's this sort of mythic quality to the book where it feels like you said, everything means something else. And this small day-to-day thing represents something so much greater in the context, but you don't necessarily pick up on that or realize the extent of that or the significance until much later on, which is why I feel like this is a hard sell of a book sometimes, because you have to tell people, like you said, no, trust me, you'll, you'll love it when you get, you know, into book two or three. And it's like, so I have to commit 500, 600 pages, but so much of that significance and the groundwork is being done in this first you know, 50% of the first book, that that quality to me is why I love the book so much and what I enjoyed reading or what I enjoyed about reading it again. They have a lot of mentions and they're not even, they're very explicit when she mentions, you know, well, this was just how it was and everyone accepted that or the rivalries or the fear of Don Aquile and no one, it's just, it's just unsaid, but known amongst everyone. And I think that kind of stuff suffocating nature of the community is really interesting and something that could be easily overlooked. Like, I don't think I consciously realized until maybe the second read of this book that they don't leave the neighborhood, you mm-hmm. know, very much as a young kid. And even in the in the intro to the book or whatever you want to call it, the prologue, they mentioned that Leela at this age never left Naples. And they're just so content to stay in this way of life. And I think that sort of coming of age story in its it is a sort of traditional coming of age, but also in an untraditional way is about their approaches to history and what came before and does that define them and how, if it does or does not define them, you know, how do they grapple with that? And I think that's why it's so fascinating to look at because you're seeing how Leela and Elena react and respond to the things around them that they do or do not have control over. Which is like a, a staple of, of any good coming of age story. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know you guys love coming of age stories. So it's like, hopefully Nicole really likes <laughs> this one. But I do see it as kind of non-traditional because I think the setting and the historical setting, but also the literal setting is just so different and unique. And like I, like you said, there's so many side characters, which I do think is different than a lot of when I think of coming of age stories, I think of like YA or like mm. To Kill a Mockingbird where there's like side characters, but they're not like important or you like don't spend that much detail. Like she doesn't, they don't give you that much detail about them. But this one, it's like, right. there's Antonio, there's Alfonso, there's Ada, there's there's like nine 
10 different friends that she has. Like, that... literally before, like, the very beginning of the story is a list of all the yes. names. <laughs> Just yeah. Like, uh, I, which I immediately skipped over, personally. I was like, this is not going to be any useful context. I have to just start reading and <laughs> oh, trust that know. I'll pick it up. But I can't, uh, like, thank you for trying with this list, but it is not going to help me. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, yeah, this was the third time I've read this book, and finally I'm like, oh, this is who, you know, she mentions, like, six people in one sentence, and I'm like, okay, so their brother and sister, <laughs> and their cousin. Like, uh, now I finally get it because I finally know these characters well enough. But I do remember the first time or two reading it, it was just like constantly referring back to that list and be like, is he the grocer or is he right. the shoemaker? <laughs> well, and they also, like, because it's such a, a tight knit community, too, like they bandy about some familial terms in ways, too, that only like further obscure that. So I'm just like, wait, how are you all connected? Uh, <laughs> That's one of those things that is like amazing when you think about it removed, but is not great from a reading experience kind of thing. Like, yes, if we're telling the story of a neighborhood, there are going to be more than two main characters and yes. four side characters, right? And that gives it a sense of like realism. And it also, I don't, you know, I'm not Italian, but that sense of like, you know, being a first generation American and just thinking back to like the neighborhood where my parents grew up and how that sense of like the neighborhood and like so and so's husband who owns the store and mm. like that whole like dynamic of like so and so and so, like, I don't know, it just felt very true. And I really liked that portion of the story, like theoretically, that they they had a true sense of what a neighborhood was but as you're reading it it 100% was like who is this <laughs> like it just it, who is she dating who is she into um you know who are they mentioning and and a lot of it because they uh, yeah it's like kind of like you hear about one person the children of the the lady who lives in their building i forget her name now melina and she was melina the jilted lover or whatnot mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and she later like dates one of them and i think this was mm-hmm. the reread that i was like oh that's melina's son antonio like okay so oh, definitely yeah. <laughs> yeah. and you realize that melina's cousins with Leela's mother so there's like mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Elena's dating like a distant cousin of her best friend mm-hmm. and he's like way older and I agree I that's this was the first time I think she also briefly dates or like flirts with one of the brother I think Alfonso mm-hmm. yes and I was like oh that's Stefano's little brother like this is so weird there's so many connections <laughs> but they're all like brothers and sisters but they're also like dating each other or they're like essentially just close enough as brothers and sisters because they all live and grow up in this really small like block together um which i'm excited to see like how that's depicted in the the show i'm not sure i was just about to say that i am really looking forward to the adaptation in part for that reason that i think that a lot of this kind of stuff of keeping track of of all of the different people i like that is necessarily resolved by virtue of having different human beings playing them. I mean, I don't know, to a point, This we, we ran into with Game of Thrones, like, I don't know, which old bearded man is that? <laughs> Question mark. Like, <laughs> whatever. But in theory, in theory, it will, it will make it a lot easier to keep track of by virtue of having a bunch of different human beings physically in front of you. I'm also looking forward to it in part because I think that this is... All the things that I like disliked about this story, I think, were probably related to being in Elena's head and I think that I will enjoy like the themes of this story a lot better without that present that's like a hunch that's a theory that I have we'll see whether or not that like that turns out to be as I am hoping that it is because I do especially listening to you guys talk about a lot of the the themes that you really enjoy I'm like yeah that's true. That's a good point. Persuading uh, you. So I just keep coming back to how how I yeah, how much I did not really care about her being in her head. So I don't know. I'm I'm optimistic about the adaptation. This this like um is really interesting to me. One, because I think such a big portion of what makes the story good is being in Elena's head. And just <laughs> and just like the that whole idea of her being an unreliable narrator. And also a thing that happens, I think, as you keep reading is that you keep flip-flopping between being more sympathetic to Elena and then Leela. Mm-hmm. And there were times where I, mean, I was even like... even in this story, there's... Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And so, but that comes from, I, I don't know, as you're reading through her perspective, but also and you start to really start to put in context how much she is embellishing or bringing her own bias into the story and how harsh she is on herself and how forgiving she is of Leela. And even, Max, you said earlier something like, oh, the competition, but it's more one-sided 
one-sided uh, towards Elena, like she's more competitive. I'm not. I'm not sure that that's true <laughs> in my perspective. Like I think that we don't. We don't get to hear from Lena, so we mm-hmm. don't know how much sure. of her, like what she's doing, is on purpose. But I think, especially on this read, I was like, oh my god, this little girl, like she is doing this on purpose. Like you know, she mentions she's going to study Greek, and all of a sudden, Lena has the only Greek book, you know, in the whole neighborhood, and just little things like that that I was like, she's she's participating in this just as much, but we're not getting that side of the story. And I think that kind of what what brings it along because it is so much of like somebody's day to day life is just being in that like frame of being in Elena's head. I just OK, so <laughs> I, one, I agree that I, I, I definitely I got a, a strong sense that a lot of what Lila was doing was on purpose. Yes. Getting like, you know, she gets the books. She's there's the, the maybe she tried to get Elena you know, banned from being able to go to middle school, like getting yeah. in trouble, like, like whatever. <laughs> yeah, like there, there's some some things that definitely seem you can see the ways in which they're both perpetuating it. A lot of those moments, though, there's also this element of like, well, yeah, because she doesn't fucking get to go to school because like, I, I, like the I don't know the injustice of where mm. a lot of Leela's shit was coming from. Uh, d- I don't know, hit me in this way that even at those moments, I was like, yeah, she's perpetuating it. But also, I can't really be that upset about it. I don't know. The bigger thing for me, though, the the reason that I didn't like being in Elena's head, the degree to which she is obsessed with this one friend is just it's too much. It's too much. <laughs> I, I, like I, I, I get having this sense of competitiveness with with a friend uh, for sure. I can understand that, and I get it. But like the all-consuming nature, like none of her life. I mean, she says repeatedly in in different ways that like her life has no meaning if she can't make it about Leela. And this and like that, I just I I mm, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. You guys. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to see how to counter that I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I understand it, but I like reading about it. I think that's what it comes down to. Like I I if you objectively look at some of the things she says or take a step back and and again it's hard to know, is she projecting this way because the book is essentially like a petty burn book to like get her friend to like <laughs> to not be disappearing from the world, or is she actually obsessed with her? I mean there are chunks of time where she goes off and she has her obsessions and she's I don't know, I'm more worried about her obsession with Nino than her obsession sure. with her best friend <laughs> because like well N- Nino first of all is a character without spoiling anything is a character I don't know how I feel about but especially in this first book he is just I don't understand her obsession with him where it, it's it's very much the petty like not petty but sorry it's very much the infatuation of young love that to me from her writing as an older person I don't understand how come she doesn't chime in and be like mm, but I shouldn't have loved right, him like this right, like right right right, right. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I get that like I I that's an interesting point that I agree with but I because I was about to say that I totally get it that like sort of young love infatuation but yes as her older self like why <laughs> her older self writing this Girl. Why? <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I think that again without I keep we're gonna have to keep caveating without saying anything about what happens later on in the series <laughs> but I think that the justification for her obsession with Leela makes sense to me as she's writing this from an older perspective and and how she wants to portray that budding of a friendship and eventually like you know a long life a lifelong friendship she wants to try to grapple with where it originated and and show her point of view and i also think at the end of the day like she's so self-conscious uh, elena as a character and a narrator and she just mm. she needs this bedrock of something to work out for her because even though she is much more privileged and she just doesn't see it which is like a classic coming of age thing where mm-hmm. you know you there's so much you don't know as you're living it but this one thing to her it's like she's surrounded by a lot of toxic masculinity and well, that's a whole other thing to talk about but all of these things that she even with Leela has this toxic relationship, but it's it's a, a girl that's her age that she lives in a neighborhood with and connects with. And it's just so important to her because I think she sees her as both a mirror and a foil. And, and that whole 
complexity of their relationship is why she's so obsessed with it because i think it says a lot about her and she just doesn't even at this late age like maybe know what exactly it's saying about herself so i think that we we joked a little bit about how she sat down to write this book in her pettiness so uh, lena disappears and her son calls her to say basically that they don't know where she is and uh, she references and we'll see a little later on in the series that lena has a throughout her life mentioned wanting to disappear and she even has these experience sometimes of like losing herself and she calls it kind of like dissolving the margins and she kind of tunes out so Leela is uh, obsessed with this idea of disappearing and then later in their life she does disappear so uh, Elena um uh, she sits down to write the story and I think that you can definitely see it from the angle of like the, her pettiness of being like you want to disappear I'm not going to let you but also I think that it it's hurts her to say that it, you know Lena can just disappear because of how much she sees Elena or Lena's influence on her as a person like if Lena disappears what does that say about who Elena is as a person like removing that influence removing that formative relationship so I think she sits down and starts to put this on paper in that kind of attitude of like she can't disappear because she had such a big influence and I think that we're seeing that heavy lens and bias in the story that she's telling with the obsession and the way that they were formative for each other and that relationship was formative but even so as you see that kind of like obsession and that kind of like narrow lens you start to see the ways that they are different and I think that Elena sees something in Lena that she hasn't seen before and she becomes hyper focused on her, her as a person even while not realizing that she's cherishing things that she doesn't see otherwise in the neighborhood curiosity just like this natural natural brightness and you know like her smarts and her willingness to stand up against toxic masculinity and the way that she when she's being brave she's like I'm gonna put my best like Lena voice on you know I'm gonna embody what she is and what she does so I think that she's really trying to she's obsessed in a way that I I think I it is uncomfortable at times to read often to read but I get what the story is trying to say about what Elena sees there and what she's trying to like absorb from Lena, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I think your point about how if Le- if Leela disappears, what does that mean for the you know Elena, the narrator, because she's put so much in into that relationship, but also gotten so much out of it. And there's a, this thing I noticed upon rereading it, how she talks about the relationship is sort of like a battery. Like Leela charges Elena, she pushes her, she makes her you know energized you know, in school because of their competition, but also just in life, like her boldness pushes Elena out of her comfort zone to do things and to be a bigger and better person. Um, And there's even this moment, I think it's when her Elena and her father are out on their day together. And which is really sad because I think she says it's like the only day they ever like spent together that Mm -hmm. she could remember. Um, But there's this moment where she, she pretends she's not with him because she wants to imagine this experience like as if it was her and Leela and she says like we were the only ones that could like imbue the city with like power and like seize everything and so she just basically idolizes this, uh, this other person because of the way sh- how how their relationship makes her feel and I mean I'm not saying that that's like a positive <laughs> you know not toxic <laughs> thing it essentially is like a very toxic relationship between the two of them but you almost see it from the in you see it from the inside so you can kind of justify it because you see all the positive things that happen because of it too but that doesn't dismiss how toxic their relationship really is when you look at it from the outside perspective. I think what bothers me about it isn't even that it's toxic. Like, I think that's, that is, it's not fine. Obviously it is bad a toxic, to have a toxic (laughs) relationship, but narratively speaking, that's, that's fine. Lots of relationships are toxic. Lots of like really important and valuable relationships also can be. And that's complex, like human, like relationships are complicated and messy. And, you know, there are things even very valuable, important relationships can also, you know, be kind of hurtful at times. And that's, that's all well and good. I think for me, it was more just that I never got it. Even with, you know, all of these pages of Elena explaining herself to me, I just never, it, that was the, that was like part of why it took me so long to like connect with this story and care about this story because I never really got 
why she was as obsessed with Leela as she was. That that for me, it was just like it never it never felt it didn't feel true or real to me that she, that she why she would come to be this obsessed. I think a really interesting thing that we see about them and the way that they differ is uh, we first see it when they try to go walk to the ocean <laughs> by themselves. <laughs> and so, like halfway there, they realize, wow, this is pretty far and it starts to rain. <laughs> and um, uh, Lena is the first one to say, like, we should turn back. But we see her kind of looking back and forth a little worriedly. And Elena is the one who worries that she's doing this in order to get her in trouble and kicked out. But I think they're we're meant to infer that there was a certain amount of fear there, Mm -hmm. something that is echoed when you later learn that um, Alina never left Naples, like she never, ever left. And on the opposite end of that, you have Elena, who we start to see um, thrives when she leaves and the way that she has an amazing day with her father, the way that she spends the, the, she goes away for a a little while in the summer and she really kind of blossoms into her own, even though something very traumatic ends up happening, she has to go home. So and we'll see, continue to see that, I think, in her story is that when she leaves, she does better. And I think partially because she's away from the codependent relationship, but also something about like traveling and escaping is good for her and her sense of self. But she, she that's not an option that is available to her right now. She's stuck in the neighborhood for for the foreseeable future as a young uh, girl. And so I think I get why she becomes so obsessed with Lena and I think that I get why the characteristics that are in Lena she becomes very attached to and just that idea of like her being stuck in here this is the only person that she feels like that she can relate to and she can have conversations with she can talk about books with she can talk about learning with and they even study together sometimes so there are elements there that I can definitely see why she fixates on especially with no other escape for the time being in even a physical sense I totally agree with that in keeping sort of some somewhat coherent notes on my reread. I tried to write down descriptions of the two characters, whether they were comparing or contrasting. And one thing I put for uh, Elena was escapist and tied directly back to that part you were just talking about where they leave the city for the first time and she feels so unfettered and free and like less anxious, whereas Leela gets so anxiety ridden over you know, being away from the confines of the neighborhood. And I think that because at this early age from, you know, five to 16 or so, they don't have the agency to really do anything on their own. They don't have that independence, especially as women in this time period, in this location. I think she's so obsessed with this relationship because Leela at least has the appearance that she does what she wants and she gets things that she wants because she's fierce and a bit wild but at the same time she confines herself to this place and time and and never leaves and I think Elena struggles with that like what could her friend and again later on in the series she I think she thinks so much about like what could her friend have done and been if she hadn't been afraid to break out of this confinement that she puts herself in and that sort of struggle between admiring her friend but also being maybe a little bit peeved at her for not doing doing as she says for others to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think I think this is still a like a, your mileage may vary. I I totally agree in terms of all of these things about like who uh, Elena seems to be, I think. And I, I it definitely makes sense to me why she takes such an interest in, in Lena or Lena, Lena. There, there are so many names, uh, <laughs> so many, so many different names in this in this book. I think that this is like a uh, my issue is more with like the degree of her fixation. And that's just like a your mileage may vary <laughs> kind of <laughs> situation. I don't have very many ne- negative things to say about the series. But one thing I noticed upon this was how I felt really icky about the way that she describes her mom and her relationship with her mother is so tied to like her mother's disabilities. And it's not really even to the outside a distinct disability. It's just she has like a slight limp and her it's all tied to her appearance and the physicality of it. And I'm, I want to like smack her because I'm like, you have so many other people in your neighborhood like projecting this again, sort of like misogyny and and masculinity on you like you don't need to be doing that to your own mother who's at the end of the day just looking out for you so I did kind of feel weird about that and I never I don't feel like 
Ferrante is saying anything with that, which is why I feel uncomfortable with it. Because I don't really, if she is, like, I don't really understand what she's trying to say about that relationship by negatively describing that. Well, and older adult Elena narrating this isn't negotiating with that at all in yeah. any way yeah. either. So, like, <laughs> this is just, this is like an opinion that she's going to assert and, like, put that out there. I'm like, yep, this is how I'm going to represent my mom. Yeah. Uh, like, yee, yikes. I think that there are things that make me uncomfortable about being in her head that I can, like, you know, your mileage may vary, like, whether or not you can enjoy the story in spite of it. But this is the one of the ways that I am uncomfortable being in Elena's head and that I can't really, like, ooh. So, it, and it's not, it is mostly kind of um, depicted in her relationship with her mom. But I think it's an overall, I think what Ferrante was going for was an overall, like, discomfort with bodies. And you've read that a lot with Elena's kind of narration her she really dislikes her own body and she's fixated on everybody's body for a portion she has this whole thing against her mom and then I think yeah at the end just kind of like at the wedding and how she's looking at her friend and whatnot there's like a very weird just sense of human bodies in this entire thing that every time that it's brought up I'm like no thank you I would like to stop reading about you noticing this right now thank you uh so that was one of the ways that I just it made me feel again I didn't like it in the context of the story even my one other sort of significant gripe but it is also kind of related to the the narrative, and this is another way that I think I don't know. Like I'm, I, I I think that you are right to say that much of this story lies in it being in Elena's head, and like uh, to have that sort of pushback on my reaction of like, yeah, I can't wait till we get the fuck out of her head. Uh, <laughs> like that's fair, and it makes sense. I'm been, been sitting with it, like okay, cool. But I because we are only seeing like this through Elena's eyes the bit late in the book the like we this is a whole joke on in in recaps for snark squad when people say the title uh we have we have a star that we give to characters who say the title of the bit with the book so or the whatever the title of the episode title of the story so when Leela says to her like calls her my brilliant friend that moment was a little a lot eye rolly because it was just it did I was like this feels so out of nowhere like I think like yes we have so shown like little bits of maybe Elena is not properly and fully representing the complexity of Leela's feelings about Elena you know in in some ways and like you see you know bits of that at the edges but not enough of it for that to have felt like it came from anywhere real like it just I don't know that mm, I didn't enjoy it <laughs> uh, I love that reveal and I think <laughs> I think when Mari and I read it together when I got to that part I don't remember who got there first but I'm sure one of us said something about like tell me when you get here because I just I don't know I I really enjoyed that flip I guess it's the expectation that you think the whole time that the title is referring to even if it had never explicitly been said in the book anywhere that the title was referring to Leela and instead it's Leela saying that I don't know I really appreciated that the first time I read it but maybe I just really like like being hit, hit over the head with like <laughs> something obvious because it's uh, I don't know I felt like it had built up to it and in that particular moment Leela is getting married and knows that basically even though this is what she wants for what she can get out of her life like she's not going to be able to go on and do things that Elena can and so she's saying like you have to be the best for all of us because you're the smartest girl in our year and you are not getting married right now at 15 or 16 so you even if she's not more brilliant than Leela I think Leela is probably the more brilliant friend it's it's that sort of recognizing reality which is one thing that she's really good at and elena is not always good at and giving that away to her in this moment where she's giving herself away to somebody else i i really enjoyed it too sorry (laughs) (laughs) okay okay so here's like yes i think all like all of that what she's what leela is communicating in that moment like yes true but the idea the thing that you said about oh you think the whole time even though it's never never explicitly stated that like leela is the brilliant friend and, and like including it in that way is totally a like it feels like a twist for the sake of a twist that aha the brilliant friend was elena all along and like that's the degree to which i was like eh, no it's not like this this that, that's not that isn't the story that she's been telling and like i i think you can communicate this idea of leela's having leela be more explicit about 
her feelings and like the difficulties of, you know, the fact that she has not gotten to, you know, stay in school, which like clearly she would have been very good at, whatever, all of that, like letting Leela have a moment to express all of that, all of those emotions without trying to say, trying to turn it into like the whole thing. Ah, it's a big twist for the whole entire story. That was the degree to which it like rubbed me the wrong way. Do you think that it really is that big of a twist? Like, when you finish the book, I don't. I don't know. I thought it was more. I appreciate it. it was kind of like a wink at the reader, like, "Oh, hey, this title of this book." Yeah, I didn't you know, want to be winked at. On. <laughs> I didn't enjoy that. But wink. I don't think. I don't really think Elena believes it in the sense that the reader is supposed to also believe it and be like, "Oh, this whole time we thought that." I think we realize. I don't know. I I read it as like they're both obviously brilliant. At the end of the day, we're only really reading this from Elena's perspective. So, you know this clearly must have been a real conversation they had and she's just recounting Mm -hmm. it but I don't know if she's trying to convince the reader like I'm actually the smart one like my best friend who's really smart said I was but I I don't know you don't use the words that are the title of the book like that's the thing it's like (laughs) the titles come from (laughs) well don't worry I don't think it happens again the, like the name the, the book something either you name the book something else or you use a different phrase there but like that pairing of the title of the book and that moment just it yeah no it felt it's it, like the nose. yes <laughs> very very on the nose in this way that i was like nah the rest uh, of the the rest of the books i will tell you from my memory do not are not direct quotes but they are smart reversals Okay. <laughs> um, maybe you'll appreciate those more because they are not what you'd expect, but they are not something that a character outright says. And I, I think that's why I appreciate it because this is just the starting point and maybe it's like the adolescence and kind of the first installment in this longer series where it's a little more, I wouldn't say it's always in straightforward because there's a lot of psyche and, you know, you have to dive in, but it's a little bit more accessible and the next ones get, I mean, the scope just gets a lot larger. So, um, yeah, I, I really liked it, but I'm obviously biased. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that for me, it, it is on the nose. But to me, it kind of just goes back to this whole idea of Elena being obsessed with Leela and that just seeming like a thing that, yes, she would treasure. And then at the end of like writing this whole thing, be like, what can I name it? Oh, yes. That one time she called me her brilliant friend. (laughs) Like (laughs) that, like her, her, like from that perspective of it it, in like out of story, it is very on the nose to take a line like directly and name it something. But I really like the twist of it being from Leela to Elena. And then just, I don't know, that I that idea of like the breadcrumbs that that we see at least through Elena's perspective that like Leela is leaving for the friendship and her constant worrying of like is she good enough can she measure up is does Leela feel the same way about her and the friendship that you know that Elena does and so to have that moment where she has said this explicitly even though you know it, it could have been more or whatnot but that's that's not Leela either so just having her kind of like harp on that little thing and then it also being a little bit of reversal for the reader I thought it was fun. I don't know. <laughs> I, I totally yeah. get why you didn't like it, but I think that it was, I don't know. There was a little bit of like wit there that I appreciated. I remain unconvinced, but uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that. I'm going to leave that lie. Something that I really loved. So that was my last like, you know, petty grievance that I wanted to put out there. Something that I did really, truly love was the sense of place. Like I had a very, like I felt I felt where we were very strongly throughout and not because there were like long extended passages about where we were, you know, like the 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 sense of place was evoked very, very strongly and in a just really thoughtful way without having to spend a lot of time explaining where we were. Just everything about like the characters and, and things that were happening communicated that sense of place. And I thought that was done very, very effectively. And I loved it. Yeah, I I agree I know that you don't really like a lot of flora and fauna. And so like in your (laughs) world building, and this definitely doesn't have it. And I don't think I recognized how she does it so well until reading this, but I think she just treats the reader like you are one of them. Mm -hmm. And she'll just throw out names of places and I'll be like, oh yes, the Via whatever. And like, (laughs) even though I have zero (laughs) idea. (laughs) But she doesn't send a paragraph like, and then we walk down a street with cobbles and like, she doesn't do that. She just talks about these neighborhood places. Like, of course, you know what I'm talking about because there is such a 
strong sense of not only the sense of place, but how important like where they are is to the story. And yes. she just treats you like you're in the gang and like not the gang, but like their gang of friends. It's <laughs> <Sure, yes. laughs> a different <laughs> gang, but I, I, I love that because it's not a really long book. I mean, it's only just over 300 pages, but so much happens and so much growth and explanation happens. And also you do feel like sucked into their world. And it is kind of mesmerizing to me how she does that. And I just, I feel that way with all her books. She has three standalone novels that are all like probably 200 pages or less. And yet they still have that really strong power. She just has a really good economy with her words that I think I don't know much about translation. I try to read a lot of translation, but I do think that Anne Goldstein who translate these does a great job. And that's all I can say, because I don't know anything about translating literature. (laughs) But the fact that to me, this never reads, (laughs) at least from my perspective, that doesn't read like, Oh, she she couldn't think of a a word to use here. So she just, you know, chose the best one she could find. Like, it just feels very natural. Um, And I've read a little bit up on their relationship and they don't, again, know who, or she doesn't know who the author is, but they communicate via email. And I just feel like there is, they found a really good um, translator with this. And I think that has to be, I want to just give credit to the translator because she does a great job at also in English, getting you to feel a sense of place as well, which has to be challenging. I think that it's really telling that this series also, t- for it to be like, there's so many little odd things about this uh, series as a whole. I mean, the anonymous author is one thing, especially with such heavy themes of it being like, you know, we start with, you know, uh, Leela wanting to fade and like this entire idea of that or coming from an anonymous author. And then the pseudonym and the like main character share a first name. So there's almost that sense that is a little bit biographical you know um but the the four series which literary fiction to be in a series is also something that's not typically done but they're called the neapolitan novels so you almost get the sense that um the place really is a character here and i think that the you know it being set the setting is just so important and it comes through even in the first book and i love what you said about it just kind of being woven in and especially because when you think about it you're like like, oh, all this minutia, the day to day. But that's really how she's building the world. And right. then you can sit back and go, I loved it. I love the world. <laughs> I love the setting. Yes. Um, so even as she's kind of feeding it to you in a way that seems a little heavy to get through in the beginning, like the end product, I think, is just a very strong sense of, of space and place. The fact that the minutia is people's lives, which, yes, me and my issues with the, the flora and the fauna, like, yes, give me people details any day <laughs> over over plant details. But like the fact that the minutia of people's lives then is also is actually like place detail at the same time. I, yes, is really just clever and good. And I appreciate that tremendously. And I think does drive home the idea that the the place is a cert- to a certain degree a character here. What you said about how the minutia of the book is the people's lives, I think illuminates for me like what, why, even though I disagree or feel differently, why I can see why someone might not enjoy the series because it, you kind of have to be like, so what? Why do I care about these people's lives? And if you're not convinced in the first 150 pages, you're probably like, I think you would be maybe later on, but that is a lot to ask of somebody to be like, you should care about these random, you know, characters who nothing big and crazy has happened to them. All the things in here, I mean, yes, there's violence. Yes, there's, you know, it's a lot of vignettes of her life growing up and maturing, but there's not some big event that she's like at the very beginning telling you, you know, this huge thing happened. And now you're, I'm going to go back and tell you why it's like my friend disappeared and like, now I'm going to write her story down. So that's a lot to expect someone to care about from, you know, right off the bat. But I just love it. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, I think it just comes down to personal preference. Like I really enjoyed it. It connected with me and that's why I bought into it. But I can totally see why other people just wouldn't buy into that. I agree. And I think that the biggest testament to the amount that I bought into it is at the beginning of the story, I was very much like, okay, the school teacher, the school, the, you know, the grocer, why do I care? And by the end, like that last scene or the last moments where um, that he walks in wearing the shoes, I'm mm. like, damn, the shoes. <laughs> like, the I'm shoes. so in to like the, the neighborhood drama that I react in a way like if I I'm part of this, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> it was like it was like the hot gossip for me at that moment where not only was it like, you know, 
a big moment or whatever, but I immediately had feelings for Leela and just like the culmination of it. So that's really like the point where, uh, you know, after kind of having mixed emotions at the beginning and then kind of flying through the end that I realized, okay, she got me. Yeah. She got me. As soon as the shoes. Yeah. I just love that the big reveal is like about a pair of shoes. I think that it yeah. speaks yeah. so much to what is important and what things mean to these people in this time frame. Like that is such a slap in the face and I think she does such a good job of building, bringing you along with them because if you had just heard this or if it was a short story or something, like you'd probably be like, oh, those shoes probably symbolize something and like the author is trying to be dramatic with that ending. But because you've <laughs> gone along with them for this and you saw the, what it what it meant to Leela, those shoes and the whole process, it was just so satisfying. But I do remember finishing it for the very first time and being and it ending like right after that. And me sitting there kind of mad at first, like really, like the ending was about shoes, but then immediately ordering the second book and being like, I need to know what happens next because like, how dare he walk in with those shoes on? Well, yeah, how, yes. <laughs> I, I had, I've had a number of complaints about, but yes, 100%, like we get to the end, like we get to that bit. And if you're just listening to us talk about this book and you didn't actually read the book, like straight up the end of this book is some dude walks in and reveals that he's wearing a pair of shoes and it's very dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Like, yeah, everyone, every, like us, like the reader, every, I, when you get to that moment, you're like, what the fuck? Uh, and, and yes, you have to like, I, I am genuinely very curious about what happens next. I, I have to know what happens. Uh, what does Leela do? Where are we going? That makes me wonder um, and speculate, like, how is the show going to do this because <laughs> right? like is it, from my research it seems like there's going to be four seasons of the show one for each book and each season is going to have eight episodes so it's going to be like four little mini series ad- ad- adapting each book which i think is great like i'm all for the mini series adaptation i think it'll work perfectly for this because you'll get to spend time with the setting and the characters and i think that they won't necessarily have to add too much to make this first book even though it's not very long eight eight episodes because I think they can do something really interesting with just spending time with these characters and their conversations and kind of drawing out some of these scenes like I cannot wait to see the little girls like go through the tunnel and try to like go to the beach just all these things I I read (laughs) about I'm excited like her some I'm guessing her summer in in, on that island is going to be like a whole episode and all this stuff but how are they going to imbue like that importance and and drama to these things that from like a visual perspective are just like physical items i'm so interested to see how they build that up and that maybe it's like through the hours they spend working on the shoes and, and yeah. the relationships they build along the way but i'm just i'm so excited and curious and excited it seems like you have to yeah you would have to show a lot of the hours they spend working on the shoes and then you also have to show like the her conversations with uh so many names. Her husband, Lila. Um, Stefano. Um, uh, Stefano. Thank you. Yes, with him. Their, their sort of conversations about, you know, how the shoes ruined her hands. Like, uh, that has to be there, I think, in order to get it across. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But, like, yeah, that, like, the, there, there, are, there are definitely bits of interiority to that that I are, will be uh, maybe tricky to communicate uh, on, on TV. But I'm, I am excited to see him try. I'm thinking they must have to do voiceover or narration mm. at the beginning, Ooh. which I'm not always excited about because I think it can be too in your face. Yeah. But I feel like it's got, if it doesn't open up with, with older, the prologue. Yeah, yeah. Like how, yeah. <laughs> how are they going to make you care if that doesn't set the stage? And from what I've heard in ver- very early reviews of the first two episodes, it's pretty accurate to the book, but they didn't explicitly say what, hmm. but I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm thinking that either interspersed or at least to set the stage, they're going to have to have like an elderly Italian woman like <laughs> narrating some sort of scene or getting a call from Leela's son. I don't know. I'm excited to see it. I'm just like, the more we talk about it, the more I am excited for it to be adapted because I think years, like a few years ago when they were like, the rights have been sold. I was like, no, how could you ever do this like to this book series? But now I think I'm, I mean, I'm not removed from it because I absolutely love it, but I'm, I'm an, 
excited enough to see how they do it because of the things I've heard about it. And Mm -hmm. the casting all has looked really, really wonderful. And the fact that they're doing it in Italian with subtitles, it was like one of the first things that I heard about it that I was like, this is going to be great. Like they're they're trying to at least keep it um, very close to the books. And we when we were talking about all of the side characters, I was like immediately thinking about how worried I am that one of the ways that you can like cut out quickly is cut out side characters. But I think that does a disservice to like some of the place setting stuff that we mm-hmm. were talking about and a lot of these characters come back in, in some of the other books like that random grocer's son that you can't remember he makes a comeback don't you worry oh, yeah. um, so <laughs> so like how they're gonna manage all that but thinking about the format and like the eight episodes per book I think they have a lot of room to keep what makes this book great and improve it for people like Nicole who don't want to be in Elena's head <laughs> so I am DB tells me that there is an actress cast for one episode as adult Elena. And this actress was born in 1951. Okay. So she yes an elderly Italian woman. Perfect. (laughs) Yeah I've heard that. We'll make her appearance. I'm excited because very early on in the adaptation process or the news there was rumors that Penn Badgley whatever his name is like there was very early rumors that he was going to be Nino and I was just like no, uh, no, uh, no, I don't think they even had a, a like a production <laughs> company yet. But I was like, I want this to be like Italian made and like through and through before they, you know, <laughs> even think about casting a Gossip Girl character. So, in- yeah, <laughs> so, so, Gossip Girl, uh, plot twist. Gossip Actually, Girl is Elena. Elena. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Wait, well, I mean, they're both. Yeah, no one knows who they are. Yep, but- exactly. <laughs> Best crossover. Sorry, Gossip Best Girl crossover. Uh, <laughs> speaking of things outside of the the book itself I wanted to ask Nicole like did you know about Elena Ferrante at all or like what was your knowledge of this book other than Marina's like pushing it on you and being like you have to read this (laughs) (laughs) other than being told that I had to read it which naturally makes me not want to want to do the thing as is is the way I I like I, I was aware that it was you know a pen name and that there was some some sort of drama where people were kind of trying to like find out who she was and that was kind of gross yeah. and like yeah. not, you know let let Boo. let her live boo to that let that's, her live. I <laughs> uh, but i that's i don't know that's kind of the extent of it okay. of, of what i knew is there anything else am i missing no i was just details? curious because i always wonder like if knowing that changes people's reading of the series because like mari said with knowing that the author's name or pen name is the same first name as the main character like I, I can't help but think, like, I wonder how much of this, especially when you do compare this huge series to, like, her other standalone books that are, like, really great, but, like, there's something about this series where it's, like, is this real? Like, is this maybe autobiographical? Like, I don't know if that, it doesn't really matter to me because it's just so good to, that I don't care, but I wonder if that changes people's perception or if people people could easily read this blissfully unaware of who the author is and just like enjoy the series for itself. I, I definitely briefly had the thought like, oh, you know, yes, I, I wonder if this is actually autobiographical and that's like why she's using a pen name. But it was like a fleeting thought and then, you know, shrug, whatever. I, I, <laughs> I don't, you know, cool. I, I, either way, it doesn't really t- like the book is what it is, whether or not it's also her life. And I... I, I don't care. I, I mean, I, I don't know if, <laughs> if she wants to discuss in further detail the the truth of it or whatever. I, you know, maybe I would care. But as it is, it's this is what I've been given to like you know to consume and shrug. <laughs> yeah, I only ask because as someone who has hashtag Fronte fever, I <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really interesting that this isn't like her first book. This is, mm. you know, she's been published for like 20 something years. It's actually, I believe she has, she had three standalones and then this book started the, the whole series. So it's not like this was her segue into the literary world. It's something maybe, and I, again, it doesn't really change your reading, but it's fun to speculate. Like she waited to write this until she felt confident enough to write it, or she felt it was the time to write it if it was so autobiographical. But I also think some of the specifics and not to say there aren't master literary people, but some of the specifics are so interesting and seem so grounded in like reality or adjacent reality. Like maybe it's not her life, but it's something she's observed and it's about people she knows or something. Because it kind of reminds me of Adichie's writing. If you've ever read anything by Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie, some of her experiences, and she's not an anonymous author, and she said, you know, these stories are often things that like, are things I hear about from other people or 
stories that I've experienced myself, um, especially the book Americana. A lot of that is sort of based on not her specific experience, but little experiences that make up a larger whole. I don't know. I just find it fascinating with this sort of wave of literary nonfiction coming out and also authors obviously writing about what they know. So I, it's just more of a fun conversation because she's successfully so far stayed anonymous. And I think that's interesting knowing it's not, this wasn't her first book out of the gate. She's definitely been to Naples is what we can tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> I think but I don't know, man. Like, maybe she's just really good at Google. <laughs> <laughs> dedicated to Google Maps. <laughs> I think that it was a big deal for us reading it. The whole idea of reading about from an anonymous author is um, Max and I met through BookTube. So making YouTube videos about books or whatnot. And I think that a lot of like the walls between author and, you know, consumer are broken mm. down because of of social media now and the way that you interact in spaces mm-hmm. like book mm-hmm. communities and booktube and whatnot and even things like we were talking recently about um maybe firefly nicole and i and how you know josh whedon has revealed himself to be kind of a trash human being and that how that changes your like interaction with a story and right. so for her to put this out there and be like you don't know who i am let's leave it that way i think is really interesting and when we were reading it just kind of factoring that into the story that she told and the story that she wanted to tell was also like an added layer of like hmm (laughs) (laughs) maybe there's some additional drama here (laughs) that's interesting I've never thought about how Leela wants to like dissolve margins and like disappear and that's sort of what Elena Ferrante the author has done with her career maybe like she's actually more of the Leela in this situation or something but I mean, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't really change anything. Matter, I just think right? I just admire her. <laughs> yeah. Like I admire her a lot for staying private. And I was definitely annoyed when that person tried to out her for, you know, whatever information they had, if that was actually her. Because I think having read um, a lot of interviews and correspondences she has, one of her core things is, like you said, you know, I think books can stand on their own outside of the author. And I think a lot of, you know, kind of like annoying authors will say that, like, well, I don't want to tell you what this means, because I want you to read it and like, decide for yourself. And like, but they're like on late night talking about their book or something. And I think she just really, truly sticks to her guns in terms of like, what she believes her role is as the author and lets it live out in the world. And I don't know, I think, if anything, that shapes my reading of it more than let's try to figure out who she is. And if any of this is real, I just think it's a fascinating discussion because I can't really think of in modern history, like any other authors that are like that. Especially because we have J.K. Rowling out here mm. <laughs> destroying her oh. universe wow. one tweet at a time. Yeah, if Elena Ferrante ever decides like to go public and just change her mind and be like, adding in all this extra world building, I'm going to be not here for it. If she joins Twitter, I'm preemptively blocking her. Yep. <laughs> Mute it. Uh, yeah. And on that note, we've reached the end of another episode. Thank you so much to Max for joining us this week. And thank you to all of you for listening. If you would like to continue supporting this podcast, please check out patreon.com slash snark squad. There we've got a bunch of bonus content and polls so you can choose what we will be covering next. You can also subscribe, rate and review, and we would appreciate all of that. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on My Brilliant Friend. There will be a post dedicated to this episode up on snarksquad.com. You can also sign up for our newsletter and check us out on Discord. And you can also find us on Twitter at snark underscore squad. You can find me at my name is Marines. I am at Sweeney Says. And you can find me at Max W. Dunn. Thank you as always to Stefan Chin for our fancy outro music. We will be back in your ears next week. Bye! Bye.